you're lying in bed. The only source of light is from the flickering flame of the log that burns in the fireplace that casts a moving shadow around the room. You relax and close your eyes to go to sleep when suddenly you hear a rapping noise coming from the bedside cabinet. You sit up only to be pouted with stones while a voice is heard from every direction. You look around and no one else is in the room. All goes silent. Welcome to Ghost Tales by the Fireside. I am Clem Dalloway, and in this episode, I'll be retelling the story of a family and neighbourhood that were tormented by what is believed to have been a poltergeist in the 17th century. In December 1695, a pamphlet was published revealing an extremely detailed account of a poltergeist in a farmhouse called the Ringcroft of Stocking in the rural village of Rerick near Orkincairn in Kirkudbrightshire, Galloway. The pamphlet was written by the Reverend Alexander Talfer, the parish minister, who was witness to many of the strange events in the farmhouse which lasted for around nine weeks. The tenant of the farmhouse was a stonemason and farmer called Andrew Mackey, who lived there with his wife and children. In February 1695, his young cows were let loose in the night. When he checked, the tethers that kept them from wandering off had been broken. He made stronger tethers, but these were broken too. After the first night, he woke the next morning to find one of the cows bound to the house, so tightly that its feet could hardly touch the floor. He kept the cows elsewhere after this night. On another night in February, the peat used for the fire, which was in a storage shed, was thrown all over the floor of the house and set alight. Luckily, the smoke woke the family who managed to put the fire out. On the 7th of March, stones were thrown all over the house by an invisible force. This continued over the next few days, mainly during the night. On the 10th of March, the children entered the house and saw what they thought was a person sat by the fireside, wrapped up in the nine-year-old son's blanket. The boy approached the figure and asked, Why are you feared? Let us bless ourselves, and then there is no ground to fear it. He saw that the blanket was his, and while blessing himself, ran up to the figure and pulled the blanket from it, saying, Be what it will, it had nothing to do with my blanket. With the removal of the blanket, it revealed that it was just a four-legged stool turned upside down. The next day was a Sunday. The family searched all over the house for some kitchen utensils that were essential for cooking that had gone missing. They were finally found four days later in a loft space that had already been searched several times. That day, the landlord of the house Charles McElwain visited the property along with another man, John Cairns, who both witnessed stones being thrown as if they came from nowhere. The stones were hitting people and they noticed that they were less than half of their natural weight. The stones were thrown more often during prayer times and more towards the person praying. That same day, Andrew Mackey went to church and after Sunday service, 
He told the Reverend Alexander Telfair about what had been happening in the house. The following Tuesday, Telfair visited the house. He held prayers with nothing happening until he left the house. He stopped in the barn to talk to two men when he saw two stones just drop onto the floor. At that moment, he heard shouting coming from the house. He ran over and entered the house and several small stones were thrown at him. He held more prayers and it stopped until the following Sunday. That Sunday, it all started again. But this time the stones were much larger and thrown with much more force, hitting people more frequent. Once the Reverend Telfair heard of this, he went back to the farmhouse. This time, he planned to stay overnight. He stayed at the property along with the landlord, Charles McElane, William McMinn and John Tate. Stones and other items, including a large wooden staff, were thrown at Telfair, which hit him several times on the sides, shoulders and head. The people present all witnessed this. When Telfair was lay in bed, the wooden bedside was pulled off and rapping noises were heard, hitting the furniture. When he was leaning on the bedside, praying, he felt something pressing against his arm. When he looked, he saw a little white hand and forearm, and then it vanished. Two other apparitions were seen over the nine-week period. A friend of Andrew Mackey's saw a red-faced young man with yellow hair looking through the window. And another two or three people witnessed a teenage boy aged around 14, wearing grey clothes and a bonnet, but disappeared in front of them. The trouble didn't stop. By Thursday the 22nd of March, the stone throwing increased along with staves of wood and started attacking the neighbours outside of the house. People visiting were forced to leave, some being attacked before they entered the house, forcing them to go away. This day it threw stones that hit Andrew Mackey in the head. Then he described that it felt like someone with long fingernails had grabbed him by the hair and scratched his skin. Several people were grabbed and dragged around the house by the unseen presence. Andrew Tate was witness to the happenings of this day. It grabbed John Keege, a miller from Alconcairn. He shouted to the neighbours for help, crying that it was going to rip his side out. That night, when the children were asleep, it took their bedclothes from them and beat them on the hips, as if it were a person doing it. Everyone in the house could hear it. The heavy bar this was used for securing the door and other objects were seen to be moving around the house by an invisible hand. All night it rattled objects on the furniture and threw stones. This happened every night. On the 2nd and 3rd of April, it started to make vocal noises, usually wished, wished, wished. which means hush. Every time someone prayed, it started to whistle. It whistled so distinctly that the dog barked and ran to the door, as if he'd been called. On the 4th of April, Andrew Mackey and landlord Charles McElane visited the minister at Buttle to give their personal account of the strange goings-on at the farmhouse. The minister offered public prayers to the family and sent out two ministers. Andrew Awart, Minister of Cows, and John Murdo, Minister of Carmichael, to spend the night at the house. They spent the night fasting and praying, and eventually it started to throw large and heavy stones, some weighing around seven pounds. Andrew Awart was hit twice in the head, which caused him to bleed and his wig was pulled off during prayers. 
When he held a napkin out, a stone was forced into it and the napkin was pulled away from him and thrown across the room. John Murdo also received a few blows from stones, which caused minor bruising. That night, no one was free from the poltergeist. Along with the stones, it threw peat, which had been set alight amongst the people present during prayers. In the morning, as the sun was rising, it poured stones on everyone in the house. Throughout the day, things kept happening. Some thatched straw, which was stored in the barn, was set on fire when no one was around, and neighbours were still being pelted with stones. In the evening, Mrs Mackey went outside to fetch some peat for the fire. She stepped on a loose slab, which she never noticed was loose before. It was late and dark, so she decided to investigate what was beneath the slab the following morning. The next morning, she lifted the slab. She found seven bones, along with fresh blood and flesh wrapped in paper. At this horrific sight, she ran a half a mile to the landlord's house in terror. During this time, the disturbance in the house was worse than ever before. It was not only throwing stones, but fireballs were being thrown around the house which were extinguished as soon as lit. It threw a hot stone onto the children's bed, which burnt through the bedclothes. After an hour and a half, the Mackey's eldest son, John, moved the stone outside. He had to wrap the stone in cloth as it was still too hot to touch with bare hands. A staff was thrust through the wall above the children's bed, who was still in it at the time. The bed shook and they could hear groaning. When Charles McElane went to the house, he went to prayer before he offered to lift the bones. But as he went to pick them up, the house went silent. He sent the bones to Reverend Telfair, who after seeing them, immediately went to the house. As he arrived, large stones were thrown at him. The house was then quiet for the rest of the night. The next morning, the local blacksmith, William McMinn, visited the house, and he was hit on the back by parts of the plough which weighed around three stone, along with other tools. Luckily, he wasn't injured. While he was there, he witnessed the house being set on fire twice where neighbours rushed out to put the fire out. As the night approached, Mackie's eldest son, John, was on the way home when he saw an extraordinary light that fell about him and went before him to the house with a swift motion. On the 8th of April, Andrew Mackie was walking down the lane when he found a letter written and sealed in blood. Written on it was the following. Three years thou shalt have to repent, and note it well. He opened it, and the letter read, Woe to be to thee, Scotland. Repent, and take warning, for the doors of heaven are already barred against there. I am sent for a warning to thee, to flee to God, yet troubled shall this man be for twenty days. Repent, repent, repent. Scotland, or else thou shall. At midday, the local civil magistrate ordered that all previous and present tenants of the farmhouse were to meet at Charles McAuline's house. The magistrate suspected murder, so they were all ordered to touch the bones. In those days, it was believed that if the bones of a murder victim were touched by the murderer, then the bones would react. There was no reaction. The letter and the bones were sent to a meeting of ministers who sent out five ministers to go to the house to fast and pray for as long as it takes. The ministers they sent were John Murdo, James Montieth, John McMillan, Samuel Spaulding and William Faulkner. 
with Reverend Telfair in attendance. The five ministers entered the house, but as soon as Reverend Telfair started to speak, stones started to be thrown at him and then around the rest of the house. The stones hit with so much force that the house began to shake and broke a hole in the thatched roof. Large stones were poured in, one weighing a quarter weight, which hit John Montieth on his back. The barn door was ripped off and all people in attendance were thrown around and beaten. This went on till 10 o'clock and then all was silent. The next morning, Andrew Tate went to the house with his dog, who planned to stay the night along with three other young men. Earlier that day, Andrew's dog had killed a polecat, which was left outside of the house. As they started to pray, the three young men were all beat across the head with the dead polecat, and then it was thrown on the floor in front of them. One of the young men, Samuel Chapman, was gripped by the spirit and thrown around. He was so frightened that he had a breakdown. The next day, another straw fire broke out in the barnyard, along with more stones being thrown. In the evening, it threw a spade at Andrew Mackey, and then a meal sieve was tossed around the house. Mackey managed to catch the sieve, but the mesh from inside tore out and flew towards his visiting neighbour, Thomas Robertson. On the 15th of April, William Anderson, a drover, and his son, James Patterson, went to the house with Charles McElwain to take Mackey's sons to help with driving the sheep. On their return, they were hit extremely hard with stones, as if the spirit was trying to break their legs. William Anderson was hit on the head, causing him to bleed. When they entered the house to pray, they heard the spirit again, whistling and crying, Whist, whist, whist. whist. It continued until the next day, but it added new words, bow, bow, and kick, cook. As it shook people and hoisted them up, lifting them above knee height. This time the family decided to leave the house and five neighbours decided to stay overnight to watch the property. Nothing happened overnight other than the cattle were moved to an area of danger. The family returned the next day and all was quiet until the night time. The sheep which were kept in a separate barn were all coupled by the neck in pairs with straw ropes that were taken from the loft in the stable. Over the next few days, the spirit carried on throwing stones and setting fires, but it started to become more vocal. Every time someone was hit by a stone, it would say, take you that till you get more, or take you that. Things started to get worse and it didn't stop. It went on all day and all throughout the night. On the 26th of April, it started talking more. It insulted everybody by calling them witches and rakes and saying it would take them to hell. Andrew Mackey was woken up that night by the voice telling him, thou shalt be troubled till Tuesday. When he asked, who gave the commission? It answered, God gave me a commission, and I'm sent to warn the land to repent, for a judgment is to come if the land do not quickly repent. I will go to my father and get a commission to return with a hundred worse than myself, and will trouble every particular family in the land. Andrew Mackey said to those who were with him, if I should tell this, I would not believe. Then it said, Fetch better, fetch the minister of the parish. A two honest men upon Tuesday's night, and I shall declare before them what I have to say. Praise me, and I will whistle to you. 
Worship me, and I will trouble you no more. Andrew replied, The Lord who delivered the three children out of the fiery furnace, deliver me and mine this night from temptations of Satan. Then it's replied, You might as well have said, Shadra, Mesha, and Abapigo. In the meantime, while Andrew was speaking, James Telfair said to the spirit, You are basely bred meddling in other men's discourse, wherein you are not concerned. It likewise said, Remove your goods, or I will burn the house. He answered, The Lord stop Satan's fury and hinder him of his designs. The spirit then said, I will do it, or you shall guide well. Over the next few days, the house was set on fire seven times in one day, and on the next there were so many fires that as soon as one was put out, another started. In the evening, the poltergeist pulled down the stone wall at the end of the house and started a fire in the stable. On the night, it pulled one of the children out of the bed and held them up, saying, If I had commission, I would brain them. On the 29th of April, Andrew was lying in bed when it spoke his name, which he ignored. It then said, Be not troubled, you shall have no more trouble, except some casting of stones upon the Tuesday to fulfill the promise, and take your straw. Reverend Talfair went to the house this day, and another fire started, and more stones were dropped. The Tuesday came along, and Charles McElwain, along with several neighbours, were in the barn. As he was praying, he observed a black thing in the corner of the barn. The black mass grew, as if it were to fill the whole house. It didn't have any form, just like a black cloud. Several people were thrown around, some saying that they could still feel it five days later. The next day on the 1st of May, the sheep barn was set alight. The sheep were saved, but the barn was burned to the ground. That was the last of the haunting. Nothing else happened. three theories that were circulated around at the time that were believed to have been the cause of the haunting. The first theory was that when Andrew Mackey became a stonemason, he took the mason word and offered his first child to the devil. Reverend Telfair dismissed this by saying, He is an outwardly moral. There is nothing known to his life and conversation but honest, civil, and harmless, beyond many of his neighbours, doth delight in the company of the best. The second theory was that a woman who had left some clothes in the Mackey's house died before she had them back, and Mackey and his wife kept some of them. He said that he'd bound them all in a sack and delivered them in their entirety to her friends. The third theory was that a previous tenant of the house, a man called McNaught, was very ill and poor. He sent his son to seek out a witch wife who lived in the parish of Iron Grey, around 23 miles away. After meeting with the witch wife, he met some foreign soldiers and enlisted with them and went abroad to fight in Flanders. He didn't return to give his father the woman's advice. A few years later, a man called John Reddick, who met McNaught's son while in Flanders, had been told of the advice, and upon returning, he was asked to pass it on to his father. When Reddick went to the house, he found that Mr. McNaught had died. John Reddick never mentioned this again, 
until he heard of Andrew Mackey's troubles. But after the death of McNaught, and before Andrew Mackey took on the house, a Thomas Telfair, not related to the Reverend Telfair, occupied the property for many years. He had heard the report of the witch wife and followed her instructions to dig up a tooth that was buried under the door threshold. He did this and never had any troubles with the house. Three trees now stand near to the site of where the farmhouse once stood, known as the Ghost Trees, not far from the village of Achenkan. Some of the foundations of the house can still be seen on what is now pasture land. Thank you for listening to Ghost Tales by the Fireside. You can find out more information about episodes on the website www.